Okay. So yeah, I work at uh, the Institute of Marine Research in, in Northern Norway. And you can probably hear from my speaking that uh, I'm not a native Norwegian. But, uh, <laughs> I've been there for some time. Uh, and I have three things on, uh, on the schedule for this morning. Uh, uh, maybe four, and we, we'll see how it works uh, with, with the timing. Uh, one thing that I'd like to start with uh, is uh, developing some some aspects of uh, spatial uh, distribution models for uh, for fish, uh, and the concepts, the modeling concepts associated with developing these models. These are primarily statistical models. So and th there's a number of uh, aspects in this exercise of modeling spatial distribution of fish that are applicable to many other types of uh, statistical models. So that's the first part. The second part uh, is a little bit of uh, only a few slides uh, to uh, discuss one uh, statistical modeling uh, approach which is very rarely used in ecology, but I think it has great value, and in this context in particular, that is quantile regression models. Uh, then I have a whole uh, exercise, a practical exercise that we can do on this, but this would take us the entire day, so we won't do it. Uh, but, but it's based in, uh, in R, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the R statistical package, but if we have a bit of time, uh, I can introduce you to the exercise and give you the code that goes with that. So for those of you who are interested in developing uh, species distribution models, uh, they can use that code, go through it, it's quite well documented, so it's something we can just start, we won't be able to do it all here, but we might be able to start doing it. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, is something that is completely different from these, from these issues, uh, and it's about uh, food web models that are built in a quite unusual fashion. Uh, this is what I call stochastic dynamic food web models, and I hope to take maybe half an hour to explain uh, What's, what's the idea? And it's, um, it's an upside down or it's a inside out kind of modeling approach. It's done the reverse way from what we are usually doing when we are building food web models. <coughs> so that's the, that's the plan for the, for the morning. And sometime uh, between now and 12, uh, we will have breaks. I don't know when exactly, but we will have breaks. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll start with this, key concepts in modeling the spatial distribution of fish. This has occupied my, uh, my time a little bit uh, before I moved to Norway. I, I did some models like this for, uh, for pelagic fish in, uh, in the Bay of Biscay, so I was a bit uh, involved in, in these uh, model developments. And typically, uh, uh, the way most people think about building a species distribution model is quite simple, and in most cases, that's how it's done. Uh, <coughs> you need few ingredients. First, you can have an ensemble of relationship that describes the niche of your species. So uh, typically, that's a relationship between an environmental factor. We have here temperature, or depth, and salinity, and the abundance or biomass or probability of presence of the species. So you have some functions that relate environmental uh, uh, status to uh, the uh, uh, biological response. And then, if you can measure, or predict, or forecast the distribution of these environmental factors, when you cross these two, you can obtain a prediction of the spatial distribution of your species. Okay? It's a very simple system, and most models, statistical models, are constructed with this framework. In mind. What I want to do right now is go into all the underlying assumptions that are there, all the data, the modeling framework, the concepts that are behind this, and try to see how good are we at making these predictions and what are the uncertainties in these kind of predictions. So I spend a little bit of time on, um, on explaining the whole modeling process. And before I, I go into the process, I just start with a bit reminder of why we want to do this modeling in the first place. <coughs> and there can be several reasons. Uh, Sometimes we're only interested in interpolating between observations, so you have point observations of different uh, species and abundance or presence, and you want to map uh, the density of, uh, of these uh, species uh, in space. Sometimes you want to project the distributions under particular scenarios, that's what we've seen on the slide before. Uh, sometimes you actually want to understand what controls the spatial distribution, 
Sometimes you want several of these or all of these. Okay. You may have uh, other questions, and sometimes there are direct applications uh, for the implementation of uh, marine spatial planning, uh, marine protected areas, and so on. So, <coughs> I'll start with a graph, which, uh, for a, a funny reason, I actually borrowed from Tom Anderson, uh, so who you heard about uh, yesterday. Uh, it's not his exact uh, graph, but, but it's, it's very much borrowed from it, and it's uh, I think it's a nice representation of uh, the different steps you have to take when you build a statistical model. In fact, it's not specific for statistical models, but it, it applies very well for statistical models. And I, I take a little bit of time to go through that. Excuse me, will we get a PDF of the presentation? I can, I can do that. Yeah, yeah no problem. Uh, <coughs> so the starting point is uh, there's the world somewhere. And we never have access to the world. What we only have access to is a series of observations. And that's the first very important point. That we don't know what's going on. We only observe a few things of what's going on. And we can observe it directly uh, with our own body, eyes and smell and uh, touch and so on. Or with a number of instruments that allow us to uh, make observations from distance and on, on different uh, aspects of the world. And when we accumulate observations, uh, we tend to find regularities and patterns. And these regularities and patterns, they, they inspire us that there must be some rules somewhere that drives how the, how the, the system works, the real world works. And that leads to intuition. And we think, oh yeah, maybe this is connected to that and so on. Which is uh, what we use uh, to build our conceptual model. But there are many ways you can build conceptual models. And how you go from observation to conceptual model is something quite complex. Uh, it's, uh, it requires imagination, it requires culture, uh, knowledge of uh, other theories, it requires a, a whole body uh, of things that are not always very well formalized. But in any case, you can end up with a conceptual model of how you think the world might, might function, or in our case, how I think spatial distribution of fish might be controlled. <clears throat> Having a conceptual model is nice, but then if we want to move into a statistical or numerical model, we have to uh, go through the step of a numerical implementation. So we have to translate that concept into some equations, into some mathematical and numerical formulation. So here again, we have to make some choices to build a numerical model. And a numerical model, uh, is something that, is, uh, that has a structure and that has a number of parameters. Okay? And at some point, we need to estimate the parameters in the model. And this is usually done through a fitting procedure. I mean, there are different ways of doing that, but it's often done through a fitting procedure against observation. Once we've done that, we, observe, we, we obtain what's called a fitted model. So now we have the whole thing. That fitted model embeds our conceptual model formulated in a particular uh, ma mathematical way uh, and with parameters that have been evaluated against uh, data. There are metrics for measuring the fitting performance. And now that we have this model, we can hope to make some predictions. And uh, we can also evaluate the power of our model in, in terms of prediction. So note that this, it's different to evaluate the predictive performance of the model and the fitting performance of the model. This is done on an independent set of observations which are coming from the real world in another state, in the future, in another place. Uh, the best would be to have two different planets to do real experiments, but we don't. Uh, and that's, that's actually quite problematic because, uh, in principle, uh, the observations that are used to build your model and the obs observations that are needed to evaluate the model, they should be independent. In practice, unless you're in an experimental setup, but when you're in a real-world uh, setup, they are never independent. If I observe the politics this year and try to predict what's going on next year and evaluate against next year data, the situation in the politics next year is dependent on this year. So these are, although your observation uh, protocol is, uh, you might see it as independent, your observations are not independent. So that's the whole thing, and what I'm going to, uh, to go through now is all these steps and show 
some uh, issues related to how we deal with these steps and the potential uncertainties that can, that can arise. So I'll start with the, uh, the observation. And again, I have a focus here on fish distribution, but you can, if you are not specifically interested in fish distribution, but in other types of models, you can think of the equivalent for your own uh, individual problem. Uh, so, observation of fish, uh, there are different ways we can do that. The, the two common ways uh, we, we do it is by uh, conducting surveys, either using a direct uh, uh, sampling, uh, using trolls, <coughs> pelagic or, or demersal trolls, or we do uh, observation uh, using hydroacoustics. So you have here an example of a, of a troll and here an echogram from hydroacoustics. And of course, uh, this is an example from the Barents Sea. <coughs> but your whole observation depends on the design, your sampling design that you have uh, applied to survey the, uh, the area. So how many samples do you have? What is the intensity? How long are your uh, uh, troll uh, uh, in, in terms of time and, uh, and spatial extent? What is, <coughs> what is the spatial and temporal scale you cover with your survey? Uh, and that is also very much uh, dependent on the distribution of the species you're looking at. If you have species that are uh, relatively evenly distributed or that have aggregated distribution, distributions, uh, you must have different sampling designs or let's say that your sampling design may perform uh, more or less well on, uh, on estimation, on estimating the, the density of a species in an area, or even the presence. You have issues related to detectability also. Are you sure that your troll can catch the species you're interested in? Are you sure that hydroacoustic can detect the species you're inter interested in? Uh, if you're interested in jellyfish, for example, you never use hydroacoustic. So there's a lot of issues related just to observation. We often take observation for granted. This is the state of the world, but it's not. It's just the observation of the world. Okay, so yeah, in terms of equipment, accessibility to observation, sensitivity, and um, bias and precision, uh, some gears uh, in, in troll, uh, uh, something we know very well is uh, what's called herding effect or escapement effect, where you, uh, you troll behind, uh, behind fish, and some of the fish, they tend to escape so you actually get less in the volume of troll than, than there is in the water, and so they tend to actually aggregate and, and, and concentrate into the troll. So you get more than what is in the, in, in the water. So this could bias in your observation. Um, there are interesting stories, for example, with the variation in, uh, in depths of, uh, of large pelagic uh, fishes. I think it was in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean, they used time series to monitor the uh, the distribution of, uh, I can't remember which tuna species, but, um, mm -hmm. but they were always doing the, the surveys at the same depths. And what happened is that the depths of the distribution of the fish changed in time. So they observed changes in abundance, which are actually reflecting changes in the vertical distribution and not true changes in abundance. So that's a, a problem of accessibility to observation. They thought that they could uh, access the fish the same way all the time, but they couldn't. So you have to be very careful with the type of observation that's available to you. Now, something that uh, is uh, very little discussed in the, in the literature on, on spatial distribution uh, is actually the variety of conceptual models you can use to explain the distributions you observe. And I will give here a list of what I think are the main ones, but I'm sure there are many others. So, the first one, and it's the most common one, is that the spatial distribution is controlled by environmental conditions. So, these species prefer water between such and such value, uh, temperature between such and such value, salinity between such and such value. So, you, you just assume that the distribution is mainly controlled by the, envir by the environment, the physical environment. <coughs> and I will, I will go in more detail through all of these. Uh, the second one is what's called density-dependent habitat selection, uh, which means the more we are, the more space we take. So if you have a large population, it will spread over a wider area, and if you have a smaller population, it will contract. So that's also uh, the, the density of the population controls the, 
the spatial distribution. Then you have what's called spatial dependency, which is often measured in space as a spatial autocorrelation. The fact that uh, animals, uh, for an, a number of, uh, of reasons that are individual and that are related to uh, interactions between individuals, tend to form aggregates at different spatial scale. So the distribution you observe is actually the result of also the interactions between the, the fish at particular scales. Uh, then the distribution can also depend uh, on the demographic structure. So young and old, or males and females, may not distribute in the same area. So if you have change in the demographic structure of your population, that may result in change in the spatial distribution. There are also, uh, obviously, species interactions. So if two species are competing for the same resource, if one is absent or present, then the distribution of the second one will be different. And persistence. And this is a typical example with salmon, which tends to return to where it was born. And this, of course, we know for salmon, but it's true for a number of uh, fish which have uh, migration patterns that are repeated year after year, not completely independently from environmental conditions, but quite. So they, are, they tend to reproduce the same thing. And the last one, which is the one I should have started with, in fact, is uh, when we know nothing, is uh, what I call geographical attachment. The animals are there because they are there. Example, the polar bear. Polar bear is only found in the northern hemisphere, not in the southern hemisphere. There's actually, there's actually a long historical reason for that. But you can take that as a starting point. I know nothing, but I know that uh, I will never model the distribution of polar bears uh, in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> OK. So this is the, the whole set of uh, conceptual models. And in fact, when you start building a model, you should have in mind that, that all of these, they, they are not exclusive. So all of these could uh, occur simultaneously. So the distribution you observe is the result of a combination of all of these, plus maybe others that I've not listed here. Okay, so, so far I just go back and so I've done this and this and I move to this part. Uh, maybe it takes time. Up <laughs> to my grade. Okay. Uh, now we move into the numerical formulation of the of the models. Uh, and again, there's many uh, steps you have to take when you do that. Uh, Often, models will include functional relationships, like uh, the relationships you saw on the first slide. Uh, what, what are you going to choose? Linear, polynomial, piecewise? I mean, there's hundreds of ways you can represent the functional relationships. There are sometimes good theoretical reasons for choosing a particular function, but sometimes they are not. You need, a, you need to try empirically which fits best. Uh, model complexity. How complex is the model going to be? How many uh, equations do you have? How many state variables do you have? How many parameters do you have? Uh, does that model include non-linearity or not? I think we're going to hear a little bit about that uh, more today or, or during the week, but uh, non-linearity can generate a lot of uh, interesting uh, response and behavior. Uh, are there interactions in your model? And then are there models as uh, additive, multiplicative, other types, complex interactions? And something uh, which you also have to consider is the statistical distributions that are used in the model. And uh, that is often an area where people get lost. Uh, you have a whole catalog of distribution and you think, well, okay, that's it. They have different shapes, so maybe I'll try to find the one that has the best shape. But they, there's also some theoretical background on why to use some specific distributions. And doing the right model with the wrong distribution can lead to very strange results. Okay, so that was for the numerical formulation. Now, parameter estimates and model fitting. Uh, something I think that in general, uh, species distribution models are quite good at uh, is to estimate uh, confidence interval and statistical significance of parameters. That you will find in almost every paper uh, doing uh, species distribution models. Because the tools that are available today allows you to do that quite easily. Uh, that part, correlated parameters, is something that is uh, 
very much uh, less well handled in uh, in most studies. I mean, the typical example is uh, if you take the uh, <laughs> the two parameters of a linear regression, the slope and the intercept. These are very much correlated parameters. Right. So if you take the confidence interval on the slope and the confidence interval on the intercept independently, uh, that doesn't that uh, gives you the impression that you could have a whole range of values for slope and intercept. But if you take one value of slope, you have a very narrow range of possible values of intercept and, and vice versa. Correlated parameters are, are, are something important and they are often not very well handled in these kind of models. Overparameterization and model overfitting. Uh, in statistical models, you usually apply what's called the principle of parsimony. So you try to get the best fit with the minimum uh, level of complexity or the minimum number of parameters. And most uh, evaluation methods, uh, they actually uh, suppose that you have uh, independent observations and then they calculate some metric of uh, model fitting performance based on how you fit to the independent observations and the number of parameters you used in your model. The problem, as I mentioned before, is that very often you don't have independent observations. A lot of observations are dependent on observation nearby, nearby on observation that you've had in, in past years or past seasons and so on. So you tend to give a lot of weight to observations, a lot more weight than they should get. get. And the result of that is often that because you think you have a lot of independent observation, that allows you to make models with a lot of parameters. When in fact, simple models usually do much better. So that links to autocorrelated observations uh, that we have. Uh, when we have a, a, a lot of autocorrelation, the true number of independent observation is much lower than the number that we observe. And then you have to choose a, how you evaluate your fitting performance. And there are many ways of doing that. And there are many ways of getting lost when you do that. So all of these, and uh, I'm, I have tried to keep track of the literature on these aspects in the last five years, but it has become impossible. There's about a, one paper a day on this issue coming out. So it's like, a, it's a very active field of research um, and I can give you some few uh, papers and reviews on this, but unfortunately I don't know of a single book that address these, uh, these things in a nice comprehensive manner. So you'll have to get lost in the literature as everyone else, if you really want to go into that. So that was for model, uh, model fitting and um, model evaluation on the on the predictive performance. So you have the same problem as for model fitting, which criteria do you use? And the additional problem of is your uh, evaluation data or predict predictive uh, data uh, really independent from the data that was used for building it the model. Now we've, we've gone through the, through the loop. Uh, there are two uh, additional uh, things that needs to be considered. One is the spatial scale. Uh, and that can be a serious problem, <laughs> is really to check that the scale of your observation and the scale of your modeling is consistent. And to give you an example, uh, trolling is, uh, or, or if you do a benthic uh, grab, is, is typically a, a, a big scaling issue. When we conduct a survey in the, in the Valencia, we have an area which is 1.4 million uh, kilometers square. We have stations every 10 kilometers. Uh, and it's usually uh, assumed that okay, the spatial resolution of that survey is 10 kilometers. So we have a nice grid with uh, stations every 10 kilometers. But now if you look at your uh, individual uh, trolls, a troll lasts for uh, 30 minutes. It's uh, 25 meter opening, and uh, the boat goes at three knots, so that 1.5 uh, uh, kilometer, 1.5 uh, mile in length. So 
In a 10 kilometer square, the actual area you sample is 0.04% of that. It's a super tiny fraction of your, of your, of your square. So the scale of your observation is few kilometers square. The scale of your model is blocks, is the whole barren sea and blocks of 10 by 10 kilometers. So here you have a problem of inconsistency between what the model is doing, that is predicting densities about very large areas, and what your observations are giving you, which is observed density on very small areas. And you have to reconcile the two. Uh, and another uh, aspect is uh, adaptability. Uh, <coughs> biological systems are very nice and very annoying because they can uh, adapt and reconfigure themselves all the time. And how can you be sure that the inference you get from the model you've just built remains valid for projections? What is the adaptive capacity of the system to actually reconfigure itself and break the rules that you've just identified? And this is something that is there. I've seen in almost no, no model of that kind. So to summarize, that's the same uh, graph as before. We added uh, uncertainties, and 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 uncertainties <laughs> everywhere in the whole process. And uh, and when we add uh, the two things I just mentioned, here you have to consider the scale also at which the entire exercise is done. And when you want to make projections into the future, so not uh, another world at the same time, but the future world. Uh, uh, something might happen in between, that is adaptation of the system to the new conditions. Okay, so I, I now spend a little bit more time on the conceptual models. I've been through this, uh, this circle of different models and I'll detail a little bit more what, what, they, uh, what they contain. So I start with this, uh, uh, the first model that I didn't even mention, but which is the one that he usually is taken as a null model, that is that the spatial distribution of a species is not controlled at all, and it is random, totally random. So there's no trends, there's no spatial structure, I think it's just random distribution. Uh, in most uh, conventional inference tests, that is the null hypothesis. So if you come with a model and say, oh, yeah, I will try to relate temperature to the distribution of that species, and I will test if it's significant. Well, it's significant against a null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is that the, uh, the distribution is random, random against temperature, but in fact it's random altogether. And this is a not plausible hypothesis in most cases. We know that uh, animal populations are not distributed completely randomly. <coughs> so a second hypothesis is that uh, there is a, ge a geographical pattern that is fixed. Okay? So you have a spatial distribution and it's determined by the fixed geographical coordinates. Uh, and this is something that is not used very often, but it's used in some cases. And for example, when you have a mean distribution maps of species based on uh, aggregated years of observation, this is already a model of spatial distribution. And the only uh, variable in this model is the geographical coordinate. So that's the only control. So you just map the mean distribution. And in fact, this mean distribution is often a good null hypothesis when you want to try other hypotheses. So if you want to try the effect of temperature or the effect of uh, uh, species interaction on, on, on the distribution of a species, it's often a good idea to start with this as a null hypothesis and say, can I explain more if I add temperature or if I add species interaction than I would by just taking the mean geographical distribution? If you cannot explain more, often it means that uh, your variable of control is, is not doing very much. Okay, second uh, hypothesis, the distribution is controlled by the environment. And this is related to the uh, niche 
ecological uh, niche of a hunched sun, that you have an environmental gradient here. It's in one dimension, but it can have many dimensions if you have many uh, uh, controlling environmental factors. And what you have is that uh, you will find uh, uh, an area where you have most of your animals uh, distributed. Uh, and then as you move away from the center of the niche, you have uh, less and less uh, densities. And in fact, that uh, niche is defined uh, without any reference to space. Here it's just the environmental gradient. It says that if you're in the right uh, band of environment, you will get uh, individuals. If you're not, you won't. And your model of habitat is actually the spatial realization of this. So if you project the environmental gradient in space, and then you project the response uh, of the species to the environment on that same space, then you get a distribution map. What these models do uh, usually, uh, or what they implicitly uh, recognize, is that uh, they look at the potential uh, for the environmental conditions to have uh, the presence or abundance of species. So it says that if, if this was temperature, for example, at a certain temperature, this is a temperature that is favorable for that species. But it doesn't mean necessarily when I project it in space that I will find the species. It just means that I actually find conditions that are suitable for that species. Okay? So the maps you usually get out of this are not maps of, uh, of species distribution, but they are maps of potential habitats, which is a quite different thing. And you will see in the uh, quantile regression why it is interesting to, uh, to use quantile regression in that specific context. Okay, density-dependent habitat selection. That's the idea that as the density of the population change, that will impact the distribution. So you have here three, uh, three extreme caricatures of how species respond to an uh, increase in uh, intensity or increase in total abundance. One is called a proportional response. That means that if that is space and there are more individuals, they will occupy the same area with the same profile, they will just increase proportionally everywhere by a little bit. Okay, so you have increased local density. Everywhere. The constant uh, model is that there is a, a limit to the density you can get uh, at any given point. So that can be uh, physical constraints on the, the density of individuals on the, on the seabed, for example. And so, if you increase the number of individuals, the spatial distribution will expand geographically. And the Basin model, and I think yeah, I have this uh, a little bit more explained on the next slide, is a, is a model where you actually increase both in the local density and in the geographical extent. So the Basin model is called Basin because you can actually model it with a, a kind of ba Basin-like uh, shape uh, model. And the idea here is that if this measures the suitability of the habitat, so if you are here, it's not suitable, and as you go down, it's more and more and more and more suitable. When, and in the other direction is the amount of uh, individuals you have in your population. If you have a relatively low number of individuals, they will occupy uh, that space, which is represented here, so you will get that type of spatial distribution. As you raise the number of individuals, they occupy more and more space, and they might even start to occupy other areas. And you get this type of model. And as they occupy, you have higher uh, abundance again, they can occupy the entire space almost, and you have distributions of that shape. Okay. So there's a good uh, theoretical formulation for the basin model. Um, which has been made by uh, Alec McCall for the Pacific uh, Small Pelagic Fish. That's quite a, a, an interesting work that's been done. But what you need, uh, remember that here, you need something that qualifies the quality of the habitat, and that's usually environment. So density-dependent habitat selection is something that is also environment-dependent. It's a complement to uh, niche-based models. Okay, and... Um, the one good example I found for that, aside from the Pacific sardine, was an example from uh, Lake Windermere in the, uh, in the UK, 
where they actually, here, it, they applied the basin model to a lake with two physical basins. So it was even more demonstrative because it was real basins. But they actually show that the way uh, pike perch, uh, pike uh, move between the basins follow exactly uh, the predictions you would have uh, from a density de dependent habitat selection model uh, following the basin model. Okay, now spatial de dependency uh, or autocorrelation uh, is based on this uh, relatively simple principle that uh, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So if I want to know what's going on in one place, uh, it probably looks very much like what's going on next to it than what's going on a very long distance away. And if you look at uh, maps of different uh, factors, and these are examples for the, for the North Sea, uh, you see that this is relatively true uh, for many of the observations that we can make. Uh, this is an example for temperature. If I want to know what's the temperature here, and I have information about the temperature nearby, that's already a quite good proxy for, uh, for, for my measure. Uh, and you can see that in many places. But of course, if I want to know what's the temperature here, and I know what's the temperature here, it doesn't help very much. You see that for temperature, you see that for chlorophyll, although it's more patchy, but you also see that for fish distribution. This is an example of this place. Okay. So there is dep spatial dependency in the, uh, in the abundance of... Uh, well, both in the physics and in the biological response. So there are a number of uh, reasons why this may happen. Uh, the pattern of spatial distribution that can be explained by uh, interaction between individuals or group of individuals, such as uh, attraction and repulsion. Uh, in fish at very small scale, the best example is uh, schooling or shoaling. Uh, but you have also uh, ontogenetically uh, driven uh, processes like uh, spawning or feeding aggregation. So uh, you have uh, fish moving in very large uh, groups. Uh, and these are also uh, bounded or constrained by swimming capabilities. And if you're studying uh, the distribution of uh, fish eggs and larvae and juveniles, also uh, related to uh, gamete dispersal retention and, uh, and also swimming capabilities for these uh, small individuals. So this is often referred to as patchiness, but you have to uh, remember that when you observe your spatial distribution, these processes have taken place and the, the distribution you observe is the result also of, of these processes. And one thing that can be very uh, confusing and difficult to disentangle is when you have an observation of uh, spatial dependency, it can be the result either of intrinsic process in the population, so real interactions between individuals, or the result of the fact that the controlling factors are themselves uh, spatially autocorrelated. So I show you this with a, a a cartoon example. Here we have the abundance of a particular or the density of a particular fish population in that point, and it depends on the observations we have in nearby locations. Okay, so there's a true dependency in, in the system. How much fish you find here depends on how much fish you find around. Now we have exactly the same observation here, but this. Uh, density here is totally independent from, biologically speaking, from what's going on uh, in the nearby location. But what is happening is that this distribution is controlled by the environment, and the environment itself is autocorrelated. So what you have is because the environment is autocorrelated, the biological response becomes autocorrelated. So we have the same patterns here, but this one results from the environment controlling the spatial distribution, and this one results from biological interactions resulting in spatial autocorrelation. Does that make sense? Okay, move to a demographic structure, uh, something I mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, sex, uh, age can control the, uh, the spatial distribution. I take here two, two examples from our earlier work. This one is from the, the, the English Channel, 
uh, and it shows the, the distribution of uh, lesser spotted dogfish. And you don't see the abundance, but what you see is the proportion of males and females in the different uh, spots. And you see that it's, uh, it's not randomly distributed. In the central part of the, of the channel, uh, you have more males, and on the edges, uh, you have more females. So if you imagine a change in the sex ratio in that population, it's possible that that will affect your perceived spatial distribution. That's an example from the Bay of Biscay. Uh, and what you have here is each circle corresponds to the mean length of anchovy fish in the Bay of Biscay. And what we know is that all the juveniles, they concentrate in that area, and all the adults, they concentrate more offshore. So again, if you have a change in the demographic structure, if you have some year class missing or coming in very high abundance, this will alter the whole uh, spatial distribution of the, of the population. Okay, I'm close to the last hypothesis. That's the one before last. Species interaction. Uh, that's an example not with fish, but with, uh, with barnacles, <coughs> and which is showing the, the distribution of two species, Balanus and, and Thalamus. Uh, and the distribution of, uh, of Balanus can be uh, much larger if uh, Thalamus is, is not there, and vice versa. The two species, they interfere. So if you find one without the other, they occupy a different, uh, a different area uh, on, the, on the coastline. So here again, uh, any, in your model, uh, in any projection you can make, you have to take into account the interactions between the two, two species to represent their spatial distribution. Okay. And finally, memory. <coughs> so the idea that the spatial distribution is not just an instantaneous uh, process, but it actually uh, carries some of the population history. And this has been uh, demonstrated uh, for a number of uh, fish species. Uh, the two uh, best known examples I have is uh, is salmon with imprinting, and uh, there's a nice example in the North Sea for herring with the reproduction of, uh, of uh, feeding and spawning migrations through uh, what's called tradition and habit formation. That is, tradition is social learning, and it, this is something that we, uh, we observe, for example, in spawning migration, that you have uh, free spawners, fish that are not yet mature, not re yet ready to spawn, but they are physically capable of following the migrations of spawner, and they start doing the migration with them. They actually learn from knowledgeable fish who have already done the migration. They learn to do the, the same migration pattern. And uh, individual memory is the capacity of an individual to actually reproduce the, uh, the migration pattern that it has done in the past. I don't know how well this has been demonstrated, but there's good... Uh, Good examples in, uh, in the North Sea of uh, spawning ground, having spawning ground being lost due to overfishing. And uh, even if the uh, spawning conditions are returning to being favorable and fishing has been cut on this spawning ground, these spawning grounds are not reoccupied because the memory as to population level has been lost. And the only time that you can reoccupy is when you have a very large air class, then you have density dependent habitat selection taking place. Fish start to occupy a very wide area. They start trying to spawn everywhere, and they and they may eventually reoccupy an old spawning site. So, spatial distribution is complex. It's many different things that can uh, that can come in, and again, they are not uh, exclusive of uh, of one another. So, when building your model, uh, you have to think: how many of these should I consider? How should I uh, uh, express them? And is there uh, a mathematical formulation that can accommodate these different uh, hypotheses. Okay, now I'll bring two few things more uh, on this, uh, on considerations on gradients, niches, and models. So environmental gradients, these are often considered as uh, in three different uh, categories. Resources. Resources is something directly consumed by your species of interest, food or nutrients, typically. Direct gradient is something that is not consumed, but that can affect directly the physiology 
you can think about temperature or pH. Um, and <coughs> indirect is everything else. Something that doesn't have a direct physiological impact and something that is not directly consumed. And this can be, uh, this, this can be relatively complex. Sometimes they are just proxy for something else. Uh, so it's a very un undefined and fuzzy uh, category. Niches, uh, I very briefly uh, touched upon this. Uh, the fundamental niche defines the conditions that are suitable for the population to, uh, to be there. Uh, the realized niche is what you observe. And again, uh, something that is very commonly uh, done is we have, so if I take a space, probably you don't see anything with your camera now. <laughs> uh, so if I have a map and uh, I've done some something and I've observed abundance and an environmental factor like temperature, I will use that to do the reverse process of what is usually done when you do the model, and that is to plot from my observations the abundance against temperature. And if I'm lucky, I get something like this. The problem here is that this representation is not the fundamental niche. This is only the realized niche, it's an observation, and the distribution here is not solely dependent on temperature, it's dependent on everything else that I've mentioned before, maybe including temperature. So what you observe here is a realization of something very complex that you're trying to relate to temperature, but you don't know to, to make a proper model, what you really want to do is this. I know what's going on. I want to plot the distribution as a function of temperature. This is the fundamental niche. Then you can plot the uh, expected uh, potential habitat for your population. But when you do it that way, this is a realized niche. And you don't really know what's going on because there's a lot of other factors, controlling factors that are coming in, in the game here. Again, I'll, I'll come back to that on the, what I did with the quantile uh, regression issues. Uh, and the type of models that can be built, mechanistic models that actually explicitly represent the processes by which the uh, individual uh, animals are, are, are distributed. Uh, and here I haven't talked at all about models of animal movements. But that's also obviously a, a mechanistic representation that can lead to spatial distribution models. Uh, statistical models is mostly what I've uh, discussed on so far. And you have uh, categories of mixed models uh, that try to combine the statistical models and some mechanistic aspects. I think uh, uh, William Chung uh, has done some of, these, uh, some of these models that mix a little bit of the statistical approach and the mechanistic. Uh, Make mechanistic models in the population. Okay, so few points on the observations, uh, data, and, uh, and distributions. Uh, again, I, I must realize this is important that what we have uh, when we have observations uh, is, is observation. It is not the state of the world. It's the state of the world filtered through the observation process that we have applied. Uh, so we have to be very careful on how we have collected the data. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, my experience with uh, troll surveys, uh, that this is a very complex process with a lot of ad, ad hoc solutions uh, to get back into what's going on into the ocean from this type of observation can be relatively complex. Uh, but we use different gears. Uh, there's whole protocols for doing subsampling uh, at different levels for uh, length, age, sex, species, whatever. Uh, and in hydroacoustics, uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with hydroacoustics, uh, but there are many steps between getting uh, acoustic signal into a machine, uh, that is a physical process, uh, and getting a fish abundance out of that. And in these many process, a lot of them are very poorly documented often. This is called hydroacoustic scrutinizing. Um, and it's, uh, it's very difficult to go back from the actual observation into 
what is supposed to be uh, in the water. Sampling design, uh, typically uh, typical designs that we know of, random design, stratifying design, transects, and so on. These also have an, uh, a huge impact on the on the estimates of abundance of density you can make. Observation scale and observation support. That's what I mentioned earlier. This is the example of the Barency survey. You can have observation scales. That is the distance between your different troll samples or between your transects if you're doing a hydroacoustic survey. And your observation support is actually the volume of, or the area that you are sampling. And this is often very, very small in comparison to your scale of observation. Okay, and now distributions. What statistical distribution to choose? So, uh, the main two categories are continuous versus discrete distributions. So, if you are looking at uh, animal densities, uh, you will uh, work with uh, continuous distributions. If you are looking at uh, presence, absence, or counts, you will uh, work with uh, discrete distributions. Continuous distribution, uh, the most common are uh, uh, normal, log normal, and gamma. Normal is, uh, we all know that one, but it's uh, distributed between minus infinity and plus infinity. So it's, uh, it's not a suitable distribution for cases where you have, uh, where you're not allowed negative uh, values. Uh, but it can be used sometimes as a good approximation. Uh, log normal distribution, uh, this is a skewed uh, distribution uh, which is uh, strictly positive. And gamma distribution is a very flexible distribution that can help you uh, in cases where you have a weird, uh, weird empirical distribution to fit. Discrete distribution, uh, the binomial uh, is uh, presence, absence, alive, dead, uh, whatever, but only two solutions. Uh, the multinomial uh, distribution is, uh, is an extension of the binomial uh, where you can have several outcomes so red, blue, green, orange, that's, uh, you can use a multinomial uh, distribution to, uh, to model this. Uh, but it, so it's discrete and finite. The Poisson distribution is uh, discrete and not finite. So you can have numbers from uh, zero to whatever. Uh, and one particularity of the Poisson distribution is that the mean is equal to the variance, or the variance is equal to the mean. Uh, which is nice because it's only one parameter, but which doesn't always fit your, your, your data. And the negative binomial is an extension of the Poisson, where you have a skewness parameter. So it's again a distribution with positive numbers, uh, from zero to uh, potentially infinity. Uh, but you can have very skewed uh, distributions, so you have an additional uh, distributional parameters. And in addition to that, you can have zero inflated distribution uh, where you have observation problems that leads to many zeros in your data uh, and there is a whole literature uh, and nice uh, tools now to do uh, work on zero inflated Poisson distribution or zero inflated negative binomial distributions. Okay, so this this is just uh, an illustration of what I mentioned uh, earlier on when you, when you do uh, when you do a troll, um, and which, uh, uh, yeah, and an illustration of which, uh, which distribution you might, uh, you might choose to, uh, to take. So, here is uh, an example where we have a, a survey area, and we will, uh, we, we can do random stratified sampling. So let's say we, we take one troll hole in each of these um, square, and uh, this is a zoom on the, each of these square. Each circle is uh, individual. And this is a troll hole, okay? And what's interesting here, here is the difference between what your model is going to do and what your observation is giving you. If you do a model of uh, the density of individuals on this map, often what you will get is you get one value for each square. And the value is the mean density in that particular square. But when you do an observation, when you have a, an observation protocol, you don't sample the entire square. You only sample a small fraction of that. And within that square, you have distributions of individuals that in that case is quite clustered. So you have groups of individuals. So it's not, they are not randomly or evenly distributed. So what you have here is a sampling process that's taking place on aggregated distribution. So if you go out sampling there, you can get 
zeros, you can get high numbers, you can get one, like in this example. And typically, here, what you are, what you are doing, uh, you are sampling uh, in a negative binomial distribution uh, with a highly distributed uh, uh, distribution uh, because of the aggregated uh, uh, spatial distributions mm -hmm. of, of the animals. So to model this, it's a two-step thing. What you have is you have a, you have a density, you can call mu, which is the, the mean density in that sampling unit. And often your model is going to work on this, try to predict the mean density. But you have an observation and the distribution of your observation is actually a negative binomial with density mu and the dispersion parameter mu that you have to uh, estimate. So it's really, uh, again, just to point that your observation here is often not the thing that your model is trying to do, which is to model the mean density. So if we have time later on, I'll go through a, an example, which is this one. It's a, it's a made-up data set, so I know exactly what's in it. Uh, and it's, uh, here what you see is a, is a bottom topography. And you have sampling stations. Each point is a sampling station. And you have observed uh, densities of, uh, no, observed numbers of individuals at each uh, station for nine years. And in addition to that, there's information on the, the temperature, I think the salinity and the chlorophyll that is measured at each of these stations. And the idea is to build a model to uh, represent what drives the distribution of this population in this area, year after year. So, uh, we'll see. But I might introduce you to the code and, and, and show you some of the things.